today, Sagar, you are nearing the end of your move. So this is what yeah, we can guarantee see, you. Uh, the uh, final episode where it's just me solo for the foreseeable future. I spoke with Glenn Hubbard. Glenn is the, or was the Dean Emeritus of Columbia Business School. And before that, he was actually in charge of the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House during the George W. Bush administration. This is an interesting episode because we heard the audience response. You wanted us to engage more with populism and debates around it, go back to our roots a bit. And Glenn is coming at it from an interesting perspective. He is part of the unreformed free market conservative right with his critiques of how populism approached things, his critique of how things were done under the Trump administration and what needs to be done moving forward. But once again, we're not expecting just to hear the usual. He comes at it from an interesting perspective. He cites FDR with um, the GI Bill. He cites Lincoln establishing land-grant colleges. So he has a different perspective on how we should actually go with change, even if he isn't a populist himself. But uh, Sagar, we, this is where we'll get you on 2022. Like, What are you excited about? Got a lot of stuff to cover this year, all that good stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm most excited for the midterms. Honestly, I love midterm elections. They tell you a lot about how the country is feeling. It's like a gut check. Presidents usually get absolutely whacked. But in terms of how they get whacked, it's fascinating, right? I also like the localization of races. When things don't get so tied into the actual presidential race, you get to focus a little bit on any sort of variance that there is. Uh, obviously, we all think that the Democrats are going to get crushed. The question is how much, where, but even more importantly, who's going to win some of these primaries? I mean, J.D. Vance, uh, Josh Mandel, is Blake Masters going to pull it out in Arizona? Are they going to have what it takes to then go on and defeat the eventual Democrat? These are all, you know, like big questions. Mark Kelly is actually could be a very formidable candidate. Georgia is another one I'm watching like a hawk. So a lot of I don't know. I, I I love elections. Election day in America is always a fascinating time. I really am. That's the thing I'm most excited for. That's really well said. My add to that is that I'm interested in seeing a lot of these narratives put to the test. The races you're saying, yeah. J.D. Vance, Josh Mandel, Biden, the referendum. What was so useful for this show is seeing 2020, a lot of things get put to the test. Did they work? Did they not work? We're getting another example of that in 2022. So quick notes before we get into the episode. Number one, we have added a fun little function to the show. We're adding a tip function from our friends at subs at Swap Stack. That's Swap Stack. They're a really interesting uh, newsletter platform that I did some work with at On Deck for the Deep End podcast. If you enjoy what we said on the show, if you enjoy a newsletter that we send out, you can follow the link in the show notes from the newsletter and send a tip to the show. As we've stated before, we are actually monetizing the show this year. So all these things out. Speaking of the newsletter, we have literally thousands and thousands of subscribers and we've actually gotten the open rate up to 41%. That is actually a yeah, real newsletter. Yeah. We yeah. actually have had advertisers reach out to us because this is now a new real newsletter. So we want people to follow the link in the show notes as well. That's the realignment.substack.com. Finally, Book show. Glenn has a book. We put our books out last year. So many great things here. Shout out to Lincoln Network. Thank you for supporting our work. Glenn Hubbard, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's interesting. I was reading The Wall and the Bridge and I also read the excerpt that you put out in The Atlantic that came out um, the day before we're recording this episode. And an immediate question came to mind. It seems as if there's two different critiques of capitalism that you're responding to at a generational level. So in the book, for example, you focus on this 1977 worker in the Midwest who sees the factory leave, who sees the rise of NAFTA, and is really skeptical of the system and therefore asking for the walls you're referring to. But in the piece in The Atlantic, you're speaking more to millennials and Gen Z. You talk about their skepticism of capitalism. And as a person who's 30 years old, what's interesting to me is most of those critiques you're listing from the worker in 1977 are entirely different from the critiques that a millennial or a Gen Z person would face. They didn't expect to work in a factory. No one thinks that an employer would give them a year's full lifetime's worth of pensions. So could we just start off by speaking to these two different critiques, the 1977 critique, and then which is more of the populist critique, and then also the millennial Gen Z skepticism? I actually don't think they're that dissimilar. The, 
the 1970s on critique was really about two big forces, structural changes uh, in terms of globalization and technological advance. Those are still playing through the economy today. A lot of what worries young people are changes coming from retooling the economy. Climate change, for example, or artificial intelligence and machine learning, structural changes are always hard. Capitalism is really good at it. The change is good. It yields the disruption that yields growth. The change also can lead to people changing out their livelihoods. That was a concern in 1977. It's still a concern today. We need to do something about it. That's interesting because the thing I just want to push a bit on is it seems as if to your point, and this is what the book really focuses on, they, there are these big structural changes that aren't just one-time interventions that folks in 77 and then today are facing, but it seems as if they're playing out in different ways. So for example, part of your critique of the worker seeking 1907 to come back again, this is a person who is very much interested in the way Donald Trump was speaking in 2015, 2016. They're interested in Bernie Sanders' critiques, really that specific articulation. You describe them as wanting to go back to a past that could never exist again. And, and we'll get into that in a bit again, but I guess what I'm more interested in is it doesn't seem like millennials and Gen Zs who are skeptical, skeptical of capitalism, it doesn't seem like we're actually focusing on any type of past. There's no basically nostalgic 1950s where everything were really perfect. So I'm, I'm curious if, if your critique of the 77 is that it's really, or if your critique of populists who've tried to respond to the constituency that were disrupted by 1977. I'm curious, what is your critique of millennials and Gen Zs, not personally, obviously, whose lives were upended by the financial crisis and then the coronavirus? Because it doesn't seem like they're trying to go back to something that didn't exist. I think they are trying to build walls, and that's the concern. It, there's always an issue when you have structural change or big shocks, like the financial crisis, or for that matter, like the COVID-19 pandemic, People want protection. The goal isn't so much protection, but to go back to what classical economists like Adam Smith wanted, to make sure that everybody has the ability to compete in the economy as it is. And that may mean different, different kinds of training, different kinds of opportunities. That's really the issue. And when millennials or any of us reach for wanting to be coddled a bit more, we're reaching for protection and not for opportunity. You referred, we've made numerous references to walls and bridges. So can you just explain the metaphor, which really undergirds the book? Sure. I mean, I think a lot of our policy debate today, we seem to be talking about capitalism versus socialism. I don't think that's the debate. On both the right and the left, political leaders are really talking about forms of walls, meaning uh, forms of uh, protection against some kind of change. Really what we need are bridges to be able to help people get somewhere or get back. That's what a bridge is. So in the contemporary economy, that would be things like helping people be able to work in the jobs that it exist. And when people are disrupted in their work, help them get reconnected. Bridges are harder than walls, which is why politicians like to talk about them. But there's much that economics has to say about bridges. It's just that economists don't talk about them enough. So this is interesting because in the history since 1977, when you first obviously entered the economic field, which is why we're focusing on that date, you tell this story of, on the one hand, you have the rise of economic neoliberalism. Both sides of the aisle are relatively more market-friendly than they were in the 70s and 60s. And then you also have these convulsions. You have NAFTA, China entering the WTO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you talk about bridges, though, at least on a political side, I think part of the reason why people may be skeptical is politicians have often spoken of these bridges. Think of President Clinton in the 1990s. His whole campaign slogan was building a bridge to the 21st century. There was all this talk of re-education, TAA, trade adjustment assistance. Yep. So wh why did this political project of bridge building not work until now? It's a great question. And I think the problem is politicians were never serious about it. I've worked on areas around trade adjustment assistance for decades. The only time it ever really comes up is when politicians want to talk about a trade adjustment assistance. 
uh, and getting a trade agreement through, there's really not much to it. It's not really helping people. If we really wanted to help people, we could reach back to when America did this on a grand scale. Think the big uh, land grant colleges that started in the 1860s. Think about the GI Bill. That's the scale of the intervention we need. What we've had from politicians, right and left, both sides of the aisle, is a bit more blather, to be honest, than real action. So could you, so we're throwing around acronyms here. Can you actually explain over the past 40 years what that trade adjustment, what, what those policies have actually looked like? What, so what, what has been offered to, let's say, a worker from Youngstown, Ohio? Let's say it's 1995. What was offered? Very, very little. The policies have helped very few people and didn't offer very much. And in the first case, if, if I'm um, affected by structural change, should it matter whether it was because of trade or technology? Many of the big heartland changes in the country that get blamed on trade are really much more about technology anyway. What we need to be making sure is that people are ready to compete. And that means access to a training and an education system that helps them do that. That's going to be more costly than trade adjustment assistance. But the alternative is a system that is manifestly unfair to many people. And what's interesting here is when you talk about these interventions, talk about why you supported, like you weren't alive during Abraham Lincoln's efforts, obviously. Um, but when, when you're referencing the GI Bill, um, you know, in the 1940s, when you're referencing the land grant colleges, why did those interventions pass your test when, if you look at the rhetoric at least, of the Biden administration, they would argue that Build Back Better and other government interventions are in the same spirit as well, too. So where do you diverge between well, those two things? They're just not. Let me, let me take your question in reverse. So Build Back Better, to the extent that it touched on any of these issues, was about free community college. In the book, I talk about the need to take more of the Moral Act land grant college orientation, put money into community colleges, give them the resources we need. The issue is not really free tuition. So I don't even think Biden folks started in the right place. To the big interventions of the past, the land-grant colleges were very successful. And keep in mind, the Moral Act was passed in the middle of the Civil War. So whenever we talk about, oh, it's just too hard to do big things in politics, the middle of the Civil War. And what the Moral Act, did was create land-grant colleges that would help an economy in transition, one that's going from agriculture to more manufacturing. It was deliberately not a one-size-fits-all solution. Likewise, the GI Bill, as we have all these uh, service people coming back uh, from Europe, from Japan, they need training for the economy that now is the growth in manufacturing and, and starting growth in services in the U.S., the GI Bill focused on that. These are really big transitions. They're not just about free tuition or build back better. So what's interesting there, though, is, and this is where this gets really interesting, especially when we were focused. So the land grant, that's establishing colleges. So for example, um, and correct me if this is incorrect, but this is like your agricultural, your state college. So like I'm from Oregon, Oregon State University, that's a land grant university, right. Texas Tech, et cetera, et cetera, Texas A&M. When it comes to then the GI Bill, that isn't making college free, but it's expanding access. What has changed in the time since basically the New Deal World War II era, where this isn't simply about lowering lowering um, tuition and expanding access? What, what's the difference here? Well, the question is access to what? So if you go back to the structural changes from technological advance, from globalization, the educational institutions that are really the foot soldiers of preparing people are more community colleges. Community colleges do very well in local areas. They often work with local employers. They talk about skills that are readily available and marketable in the local economy. They are, however, underfunded. And we need a massive support for community colleges if we're to get there. We also may need to support four-year universities, but community colleges are really on the front lines of this retooling of the economy. If you think about a bridge, again, it's to prepare you to get to a new place, but also reconnect you if somehow you were pushed away. Community colleges are very good at that. What's interesting here is 
what it see the thing that it seems to be suggested here is that the issue isn't necessarily that community college costs money. It's that community college as an institution, whether it's free or not, is currently ineffective. Is that is that a good articulation well, of it? It's it's so underfunded. It's very difficult to connect as many people to skills, and those aren't just young people going to school for the first time. It could be older people coming back for new training and skill development. Community colleges just lack the funding to do that. We're talking about technological change is one of the factors that's undergirded a lot of the economic disruption. To what degree do you think technological change in the internet should upend or even our conception of what higher education community colleges look like? Well, I think it already has. I mean, we already have a big growth in community colleges and frankly, many four-year universities as well in online education. Uh, probably bigger opportunities exist in hybrid learning where some things can be done online, some things face-to-face, and could lower the cost of education. Community colleges tend to be particularly useful, though, for two reasons. They're connected to very specific skills in the workplace, and they often have very good relationships with local employers. So technology may help that, but it doesn't fundamentally change the equation. So the question then is, why hasn't, and this is where this gets complicated, and this is why I think the conversation with your MBA students was interesting, because there's this big debate about societal fairness and the way our society is structured, and oftentimes that gets wrapped into the debate around capitalism. So people will put the fact that the price of college has gone up in the category as a fault of capitalism when there's a lot of complicated factors there. But at least historically, and even during the coronavirus, increased online education did not lead to cheaper prices. Um, that's not necessarily capitalism's fault, especially because this is often state institutions or private institutions who are supported by government-backed loans. How should we address that part of the dynamic then? Well, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, higher education is very expensive uh, in the United States, uh, particularly at research universities, where a lot of what's being funded is research. We need alternative ways of getting access to education. Part of that's online learning. Part of it's, as I said in the book, you know, increasing the resources for um, many institutions. But it's wrapped in the bigger question I think you were hinting at earlier, which is we're not doing enough to help people who are left behind by technological advance or globalization. You know, chances are when any listener took Econ 101, The professor talked about gains from trade and gains from technology, and he or she was telling you the truth. But the professor probably also said, and the gainers can compensate the losers, but never really said what that meant. What I mean in the book are really bridges. That's what that compensation is. What is it that would take to prepare people to compete with the winners? So what do you think about, and this is where the metaphor gets interesting, is universal basic income a bridge or is it a wall? A wall for sure. The the, the goal, if you go back to Adam Smith and other sort of classical economic thinkers, their goal writ large was mass flourishing, not just GDP as we would call it today. And what Smith had in mind in mass flourishing was everybody being connected to and participating in the economy. Classical thinkers thought of this as a key source of dignity for people that comes from work and participation. Universal basic income is a well-intended idea. It could even offer some efficiency gains if it replaces some other programs, but it doesn't really connect people to work. That's really about skills and preparation and bridges. So I worry it creates a sort of two-class system that some people are able to participate in the economy. Others are just pushed aside and given a check. We should want better than that. And this is where this gets interesting. Why, I, I agree with what you're saying directionally, but it's not as if we're saying UBI has to offer $50,000 a year. It seems like the more, I'd say, credential is the wrong way to put it, but I think that the, the more practical UBI advocates really just say, no, we're talking $10,000, $15,000. Effectively speaking, no one is going to only be taking that UBI check and not working. Is it not possible that there's a messy middle that could be found there, do you think? One thing there is, but it's not UBI, it's building on the system we have. So in the U.S., we have an earned income tax credit that supports work. 
but it's not generous enough, especially- Can you explain what the EITC, so this is, can you explain what it, what it actually is though? Sure, the earned income tax credit is basically a work support. So if I uh, get a job at a low wage that's under the earned income tax credit threshold, the taxpayers collectively will help top me up with extra income. The EITC earned income tax credit was envisioned as a work support program it's, however, as much of a family support program as it is a work support program. We need to do much more for younger single workers. So that's a messy middle. Uh, in Europe, other countries have experimented, for example, with uh, support on the labor demand side that is subsidizing firms to hire people. Either way you do it on the worker or on the firm, you're encouraging work. That's not just a semantic difference with UBI, because in order to advance in the labor market on some ladder, you got to get on the ladder in the first place. So supporting low wage work is important. So we need to spend more money, but I'd rather spend it on that than UBI. I'd like you to respond just to a basic audience advocate question here, which is one of the stronger arguments for UBI, and I mean stronger in the terms that has a lot of emotional resonance, is just this idea that it's true. Capitalism has produced it, produced this massive society with all of this wealth. That wealth tends to, for a variety of economic reasons, um, concentrate in specific categories. So is it the worst thing in the world to just let people be artists, let people if people want to mope about in American society where we have a multi-trillion dollar economy, what is the moral cost here? This is getting to the Adam Smith argument you're making here. What is the moral cost of allowing people in a, in a society full of bounty? Because once again, you don't have to be confiscatory to do this. You can still say, hey, Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, do your thing. We're just going to let other people be artists in Greenwich Village. What What, what is the moral problem with that? I, I think your question if I may, might miss a point. I, I'm not sure the social problem in America is that more people want to be artists in Greenwich Village. I think what Adam Smith would say, the social problem is more people wanted to be connected, participating in the economy. And that is pretty much tied to work. So there's certainly role for UBI type programs, but it will never achieve the mass flourishing if your goal is participation in the economy. Now, I certainly don't have a monopoly on philosophical wisdom. If, if your goal is to be an artist in Greenwich Village, I suppose I probably can't help you. But I don't think that's the goal of most people who've been displaced by technological change. And I think the real issue is how do you help everybody actualize the potential inside them? That's what Adam Smith was asking. That's not what neoliberals and recent politicians have been asking. See, this is interesting because your your point about people want connectivity through work. The obvious question then is, to what end? So to speak to the good faith articulation of what many people in Youngstown liked, working in a factory with a lifetime pension where there was a good wage, you could support a family on a single income, that sounds great. You know, your company has an annual picnic, all that junk. What doesn't sound as great, and I think this is where a lot of the skepticism comes from, is connectivity to, say, working in a overcrowded or, let's say, over um, overworked Amazon warehouse. So can you speak to the nature of the – so I, I totally agree with your argument about how work is important. I just took two weeks off for Christmas break, and I feel terrible. So I'm glad to be back at it today. I, I feel this. But speak to the actual – work that people are doing in the 21st century and how that in of itself can feel maybe not meaningful, but fairer, at least perception wise. You're asking a super important question. And part of the problem in the displacement from technological change and globalization is that we didn't really prepare people to be successful at other kinds of jobs. And then we, we led to comparisons of, oh, I used to have this, and now I have a, a much lower paying job with much less security. We could have done much more in the middle, everything from training to work support, even wage insurance for older American workers. But we didn't do any of that. And I think that's what has caused the angst in people. You know, when we say um, it's fair to have technological change and, and globalization. That, of course, is true. It makes us all better off on average. 
But to be fair to more individuals, we need to give them the ability to compete better so that we don't get at the kind of comparisons you're raising. Super important point. Yeah, and I want to speak a bit about, I don't want to say it's a slightly revisionist history, but you kind of tell the story of the 77 to basically the Bush administration where you served in an interesting way where you 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 describe blind spots that, let's say, more free market oriented people, both politicians and economists basically had. But it seems like the very basic response that people would have had during, let's say, the trade adjustment debates in the 1990s were, the economy is, this is pre-dot-com bubble bursting, but the economy is doing great. The economy does great. It lifts all boats. To, to what degree does the story you tell reveal a blind spot that free market advocates had? Well, I think the blind spot comes from a few factors that I talk about in the book. One, that these changes are very long lasting. You know, a lot of the policies we have are designed to help people over a business cycle. You know, I lose my job. A few months later, the economy's better. I get my job back. That's not what we're dealing with. That's point one. Point two is how geographically concentrated a lot of this is. And so not just my firm and my job is hollowed out, but maybe everything around me, what am I going to do? Whole communities, whole groups of people feel, feel left behind. The blind spot was not about what was happening on average. I think economists pretty much got that right. These were good factors. They did help people on average. Uh, Democrats like Bill Clinton or Republicans like George Bush were both on the same side of that coin. The issue, though, was what are we really doing to compensate individuals and communities that are left behind? And by compensate, I don't mean writing them a check. I mean, how are you preparing them to compete? You know, as we were talking earlier about trade adjustment assistance, politicians mouthed the words, but really didn't say much. And I think economists, too, were looking at average data, uh, the success of business and productivity, without thinking about these groups of workers. And in our economy, that's manifestly unfair to those workers. It also has political consequences that we're certainly living with. Something I'm interested in, and you hinted this a bit in the book, is What is the difference between government's role in the face of long-term structural changes versus one-off crises? So for example, the 2008 financial crisis, the coronavirus pandemic, especially towards the start where you see a lot of discourse around bailouts. We bailed out financial institutions. We didn't bail out Mortgage owners who, through some combination of fault of their own and lax government policies, were left in a really terrible situation. How, how do you think about the dichotomy between those one-off events and structural change in terms of compensation and the government's relation to actual people? Well, I think in terms of the financial crisis and the coronavirus pandemic, while they were, quote, one-off, I certainly hope the coronavirus is one-off and the financial crisis – they still had long lasting political effects because different groups of firms, different groups of individuals were treated differently. The structural change point I have in mind are slower moving forces that take a long time, like technological change, like globalization. In the economy today, I would think of um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, the adaptation to climate change. These are going to have big, big, big changes in the economy many of which are positive, but some of which are going to be negative for some communities and groups of people. I don't hear enough of that being in the thought process. When Abraham Lincoln was pushing the land-grant colleges in the Morrill Act, he wasn't responding to high-frequency things about the Civil War. He was talking about the future and about where opportunity might come from and how you would prepare young men and women for that opportunity. You no, know, this is interesting because you're you're speaking to when you're describing the lack of follow through beyond just the articulation of convenient phrases. It seems that you're getting to a lack of vision. You could say that Abraham Lincoln and his version of the Republican Party in the 1860s had a vision. You know, putting aside Native Americans and obviously the complicated moral side of this, you have the frontier. You have manifest dens- a destiny. You have expansion. That was that was a vision. What what. It seems to me that if you're advocating for politicians to adopt the track that you're taking, there needs to be a vision that people can buy into. 
what what would what is your closest articulation for a vision for how the policies in the framework are providing in the 2020s and 2030s can actually what, what, what would just be the starting point for that vision do you think it would be what adam smith and other classical economists would have thought of as mass flourishing and and mass prosperity you know economists point to the fact that Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, which is, of course, a classic economic treatise, probably the foundation for all of economics and perhaps even capitalism. But Smith also wrote the theory of moral sentiments. And in fact, he wrote it before he wrote The Wealth of Nations. In that book, he used the phrase mutual sympathy, which today we would call empathy. I think what Smith had in mind was everybody being in the boat everybody participating, everybody having that opportunity to connect, that's a vision and a goal. Notice how different that is from just saying, let's grow, or let's uh, look at everybody on average. It's not that those are bad things. They would be incomplete in the Smith, both of the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations. Something I'm wondering about then too, related to this is just the the obvious elephant in the room when it comes to this conversation, which is which is China. Um, on a couple of different levels, there's obviously the conversation around the Trump administration um, and their tariff policies and various debates there. But there's also just the question of letting um, China into the WTO. You catalog this in the book, the broader debate about the China shock and the very specific harms there. This is what I think folks need help understanding. To what degree are the disruptions you're describing inevitable? And what I mean by that is, One could look at the WTO in 2000 and admitting China to it and say to yourself, well, hey, globalization, like we said, is inevitable. Um, Information moves faster. He would travel more. This is an inevitable reality. Does that inevitable reality mean that China should be let into the WTO? And and I don't want to just like get into the debate or whether they should or should not have. That's been we've had that too many times, honestly. What I more mean, though, is what is the difference between inevitability and distinct policy choices that could go either way? Great question. Let me step back just a little bit, because I think people forget sometimes that the gains from disruption have a flip side of the wake or the cost of disruption. So every time you have a change in trade or an innovation, you create new possibilities, but at the same time, some people get disrupted. What I'm asking for in the book is for politicians to have that other side of the coin in mind, as well as the gains when they're thinking it through. China, the WTO was a hard question because China really was never going to obey the rules of the WTO. China has always had a much greater reliance, I think, to its own detriment on state-owned enterprises. Time will tell whether I'm right or the Chinese uh, are right. I think the question, though, for American policymakers or European policymakers is if there's a shock from globalization or technological change, are you thinking ahead about how to prepare people and communities for dealing with that? Imagine the same time we were doing that in the early 2000s, we had had a massive program for training. Imagine that we had block grants for communities to help with this location. We can only say imagine because we didn't do any of it. What's interesting there is that takes us into the story of some wall building that you were involved with by definition because you were you were a part of the administration that speaks to uh, George W. President Bush's um, steel tariffs. This also speaks to um, a policy critique, which was um, President Reagan's um, import ban on Japanese automobiles in the in the wake of the U.S. automobile industry getting honestly wrecked. You, you, you do a good job of pushing politicians from an economic perspective. I want to push you from a po- politician. So pretend, pretend I'm a politician. It's true that there are all these sorts of policies we could pick to maximize efficiency, but you also have to make political decisions, and as you as an economist know that there are trade-offs. It seems to me that a politician could argue that passing steel tariffs or passing automobile import bans, they might not be economically efficient, but they could be politically efficient. So the same you know, 1980s America that banned Japanese auto imports was then the America that – 
liberalized significantly when it comes to economic policy. NAFTA was 10 years down the line. So to what degree do you think that there have to maybe be some degree of trade-off between pure economic efficiency, but also political efficiency? Well, it's a great question. My wife always tries to divide up everybody into two groups, economists and real people. And when I talked to President Bush, he was clearly a real person, uh, not an economist. And he did face the trade-offs that you mentioned, but you could still do better. So taking the uh, vertical restraints that uh, President Reagan did or President Bush's uh, steel tariffs, we could have done better by simply helping individuals and communities. So it's not saying do nothing. The, the problem economists have had is that we've tended to be, dare I say, a little too laissez-faire. You know, just say, you know, go ahead, liberalize because it, it makes you better off. And that is, if that's the only advice you give a politician, it's not a surprise when he or she says, you know, I don't think I, I can do that. And in President Bush's case, to his credit, he was very concerned about getting trade promotion authority. And he thought, if I can make a little compromise here, maybe I get this bigger thing there. And that's a reasonable way to think. The problem is we could have done better. We actually could have done better by helping people and communities. And I think that's where economists may have missed a step. It's interesting. You're describing two groups, people and economies, but you're missing a third, which is the industries themselves. So I can agree with you that there would be a more efficient way of helping a former factory worker in Dearborn, Michigan, than banning Japanese autos. But what about the clear national security case, let's say, and not even just national security, just the idea that we should have an American auto industry. And I'm bringing up national security in the sense that what happened to Ford, Chevy, and Co. during World War II is converted to um, wartime production. So where does industry and industries of national importance come into the framework there, aside from just people and communities? Well, national security can certainly be an argument. I, I wouldn't put it in the context of the automobile industry. We should care a lot about having the industry in the United States. And I would hope that American firms own it, but to the extent that foreign firms are also building cars in the United States, that's totally fine with me too and should be fine for all of us. I think the real question sometimes is industries would like to protect the situation they have. And industries are not always on the same side as workers or overall public policy. So we all need to think about change. We can't celebrate the positive aspect of change and then say, oh, but I don't want the negative aspect of, of change. The U.S. steel industry was too slow to change. And that hurt both steel companies and steel workers. So I don't think we want to go around bailing out industries all the time. I think that's risk the same kind of wall and political economy problems that I talk about in the book. See, that's interesting because you seem to be implying when you were speaking about um, the auto industry in the United States, obviously those Japanese imports are often built and are built in, let's say, the South, where there's a variety of like labor practices that make that possible. So it seems like it seems like you are suggesting that it doesn't matter if the American audio industry is American, quote unquote, or Japanese. Well, I don't think I said that. I think I said it would be great if we had American firms owning these things, but we want the most efficient firms owning things. That's what's going to lead to the best prices for consumers and the greatest returns uh, on investment in, in those businesses. I think to the extent that American firms are competing well, they will win, not only in the auto industry, but in, in other industries. Government does have legitimate national security concerns, but I would hate to see us use too heavy a hand and use the word national security too often. I'm going to go back to the messy middle idea and just wonder if, because like you said, you, you, you had the proper and correct response that the audio industry of the 1970s and 1980s was not peachy keen everything was great and there were these unfair Japanese competitors. They had terrible cars, insert Ford Pinto reference, um, which obviously wasn't alive for, but we all know that one. Um, terrible union contracts, like a failure to really, once again, like you said, understand the fact that they weren't just competing with a destroyed 1950s world right, post-World War II. But isn't it possible that there's just a middle there that we could say, listen, we're not just going to nationalize you and let you do whatever you want. 
but we do want to still have Michigan exist. Like, so I, I guess that's what I'm more what I'm more getting at. Well, but I think that's less about industry and more about people and community. So I think the legitimate public policy response is if there are workers who've been dislocated by change, whether that change comes from a foreign competitor, from technology, or a competitor at home, if a community's livelihood is threatened, we can go in and help there. That's why I talked about ways to build bridges for individuals and for communities. I'd be a little less sympathetic to bailing out firms. That's what the market is there for. So we're nearing the last part of this. Something I'm wondering a lot about, we, we recently had an episode around um, batteries um, with a Georgetown professor, um, electric vehicle batteries. And the fact that there is this largely not largely literal, literal global um, competition between Europeans, um, the Chinese, and, and the U.S. How do you think of the government's relationship to not merely industries like the auto industry, but technologies itself? Um, because in in the case of let's say electric vehicle batteries, that's a little different than saying, "Oh, let's just support the auto industry because that's Ford." What's the difference between Ford and Chevy? Not really that much if you think about it. But when it comes to vehicle technology, like actual technology, what is the government's relationship when it comes to supporting that part of the industry? Well, it's a great question. In the book, I talk about the need and and electric batteries is a great example of having applied research centers around the country that are taking cutting edge basic research, things like batteries or others, and pushing them out to more practical application. I do think the government has a role to play there. That's very different than subsidizing particular firms or bailing out firms. The same is, by the way, going to be true in addressing problems of climate change. There will be technological developments that can be helped by publicly supported basic research and applied research. So that remains important. So then related to electric vehicle batteries, people would think of the best faith examples from my perspective of where walls would make sense would be, let's say, the semiconductor industry. You could say, listen, obviously the situation we have with TSMC and Taiwan, these are these are excellent semiconductors. They're cheap. They undergird all of our products from these computers to the car and all that. But it's a problem that our geopolitical rival is right next door. Therefore, we need to create a U.S. industry, even if that's a little less economically efficient. W- what is your response to that dynamic? Because I, I think my one broad area of, area of pushback is that maybe there's a little di- too much of a dichotomy between walls and bridges. Maybe we should have a situation where it's ninety percent bridges and then ten percent walls. Like, what, what do you think of that? Well, the, when I talk about the wall and the bridge, I'm not thinking about national security issues. Obviously, if there are externalities from national security, we have to be on that. And you mentioned a very, very important one. I remain skeptical that we would want the entire industry in the United States mm-hmm. in the name of national security. But certainly national security uh, is a factor and is an entirely legitimate reason for building small walls. But that's not what most politicians talk about when they're talking about walls. What are they talking about? Protection, bringing back the past, uh, you know, helping restore the way things used to be. That's just not possible. You know, it's interesting. A critique of free market, let's say more traditional conservatives, is that they, in their own sense, are trying to bring back a past. You know, trying to bring, and this is Ronald Reagan's important innovation here, obviously, is trying to bring back that pre-1932 conception of the U.S. government. So if you're critiquing, let's say, the wall builders, what what is just a general reality of, let's say, the expansion of government that more free market, constitutionally oriented conservatives have needed to or maybe even have started accepting? Great question. You know, we all need to ask ourselves, there are a lot of risks out there in the world. What risk should I be bearing as an individual? What risk does my employer bear? And what risk does the state bear? So when we're talking about these big structural changes, It's unfair to ask you or me or anybody to bear all of the risk of technological change or globalization. It strikes me that's a very legitimate role for the state to help the market. Now, the question is how? You know, this is the wall versus the bridge. I can say, well, I'm just going to pension you off or I'm going to shelter you against that change. That would be one approach. Another approach would be to spend the money to help people compete. 
in that new world, I don't think it violates being a conservative to actually embrace that role of the state. And for the last row section here, I would love for you to give a rehash of basically the four years of the Trump administration, because this podcast is called The Realignment because initially we were very interested in this idea that President Trump was advancing a different style of approach to economics from the right. Obviously, um, Patrick Buchanan, Ross Perot had articulated this in the 1990s, but Trump is actually a politician who is not only elected to that um, position, but he defeats a set of conservatives, some of whom you supported, um, who advanced the more traditional approach here. How, how did? How would you say, from a pure econ- economics perspective, how did the four years go? So, what were re- the results of the wall building, literal and figuratively, obviously, during the Trump administration? Well, it's great. I, I think you have to give President Trump some credit for noticing some problems that more mainstream politicians, be they center right or center left, simply hadn't. President Trump called out China and called it out in a very aggressive way and probably correctly so. President Trump noticed some of the problems of technological change and globalization and their effects on individuals and communities. Having said that, the approach of build a wall, physical or metaphorical, anti-trade, anti-immigration, that's not the way to go. There are ways to help people, to help communities to, to compete. So I don't think you want to say, let's embrace Trump or throw Trump out. I think you have to say, look, the guy called out some things that needed to be called out. Now, what are we going to do about them? And that strikes me as the question for the center right and the center left in America today. How are we going to deal with these problems? Speaking of a question for the center right and the center left, immigration is one of those is one is one of those questions. And uh, it seems like one of the arguments that the populist right is having, let's say, what the strongest impact on is this argument around let's put aside um, debates around like undocumented immigration, this idea of, listen, the Trump years immigration restriction, tight labor markets, wages went up, communities were served. What do you think about that argument? Because you were citing immigration, and that's another example of openness. Um, how, does, how does immigration play into all of this? Well, there's two immigration issues that sometimes get conflated in the public's mind. One is very high-skilled immigration. So um, my students, who are not Americans or engineers or doctors, uh, I don't think that's uh, – Uh, anything at all against America's interest to have more talented people in our country. In fact, I I would want every talented person in the world to want to work and live in my country. Low-skilled immigration is where the rubber meets the road in the political debate, and people disagree over the effects on wages in a way that they don't disagree pretty much on engineers or doctors or, or even business people. That's the conversation we need to be having. The wage gains in the years President Trump was in office did reflect an improving economy. They reflected some of the productivity effects of cutting corporate taxes as well. But I don't think you can say that they're really a boon from uh, anti-immigrant policy. So for the last, 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 actually promised last bit here, I want to just ask you three more topical questions that are on people's minds. So just one, inflation. Um, this is like, this is speaking of the 1970s, this is a topic that just came out of um, nowhere in terms of like, obviously there's been a long-term discussion in the field about inflation, but if you just spend any time perusing Twitter, this has moved into the popular discourse. So just what is your general perception of the debates around inflation right now? And either Biden administration responsibility or broader structural factors? Well, the big issue that led to the inflation burst that many economists, myself included, have been worried about for about a year now is the fact that demand was so heavily supported in an economy where supply constraints were the problem. So this isn't the global financial crisis where we had a sudden collapse in demand. We had supply constraints during the coronavirus pandemic And yet we had massive sets of policies, the first one or even one and a half of which might have done some good, but the rest was just overly increasing demand. Now, the real question, and no one knows exactly how this will pan out, is how, quote, transitory is this? To me, I think of transitory as, is it getting into people's expectations, whether they're individual workers or business people? I think the answer to that question is yes. Yes. 
I think the Fed has some work to do, but so too does the administration with um, calling for increased deficit spending in an environment where that's not warranted. So yes, inflation is concerned. Public's right to be worried about it. And then you reference supply, just where, and I realize Christmas ended up getting saved to a certain degree, but where where do we basically stand with the broader, I say the more structural part of the supply chain um, crisis conversation? Well, it depends obviously on the type of goods. Some supply chains are working uh, fairly well, but in food products, some areas of manufacturing are still disrupted and getting people to work given legitimate coronavirus concerns. So I I do think we have a supply-constrained economy, and that will work itself through. The point I was making about inflation is don't pour gasoline on a fire by trying to add to demand when demand's not the problem. And the last thing I'm wondering about is we're speaking of these really tectonic economic disruptions, technology, globalization. A third one we could add that's been very impactful on white collar workers such as myself has been just work from home. And the fact that I'm recording this podcast from home, I live in New York City now, but I'm long term planning on just leaving the East Coast because I could pursue this career in podcasting without having to be in that real media center. To what degree do you see that real? And once again, plenty of workers don't have this privilege, but even if even 10% of workers never go back to the office, that's huge, especially in a lot of different cities. How do you see this disruption playing out long term? It's a huge question. I think it's going to change the way work done in teams. I I think it also raises issues of how valuable is this so-called water cooler effect of being in the office and talking to other people. If you're working by yourself and you can work remotely, well, good for you. But if you need to work with others, might there be some kind of middle? So my guess is we're still going to see something more hybrid. But we also shouldn't forget the many, many Americans for whom this just isn't really uh, an option, or at least an option in the present. We need to be fair to them, too. Well, Glenn, thank you so much for uh, taking the questions. Um, The book is out later this month. I really, really um, enjoyed it. And uh, I hope you have a good rest of the uh, launch and start to 2022. Thank you. You too. Happy New Year.